Choosing the right spotlight caches to open can be a big part of how you make your journey in Marvel Snap easier. Let's take a look at the upcoming spotlight caches and what I think the best ones to open are. On November 28th, Martyr enters the game as the newest card to come out of spotlight caches. She is a one cost four power unit and her downside is at the end of the game she will move to a location that loses you the game if she can now i don't really get what they were going for with this card i'm going to be completely straightforward my first thought process when i saw martyr was okay so it's a one four that means if i fill up all the lanes i just get to play a one four that's pretty good and then i realized if i fill up all the lanes i can already play a one four that's ant-man when this card was in development, it was being pitched as a 2-6, like when it was first data mine, and I think that stat line is actually a lot more interesting. As a 1-4, not only is it vulnerable to Killmonger, it's almost a side grade to Ant-Man in any deck that would want to run it reliably. Now, I'm not saying this card is like 100% unplayable. What I am saying is that when you look at a card, your job in terms of evaluating it should be looking at it and saying, how can I make the downside as small as it's possible and the upside as big as possible? And with Martyr, it needs to be played in a deck that wants a 1-4 and is willing to invest in filling the board up to do that. It's just that there's already something that you can do if you're doing that, and that's Ant-Man. That's the problem. I think the issue is there aren't a lot of decks that actually want a 1-4. And that's the major, I guess, issue that I think this card runs into, which is, what am I going to play that actually wants a 1-4? I think the only use case that I came up with for this guy was you could play Martyr and Adam Warlock, and then Adam Warlock would likely draw a card. But that seems a little bit overly telegraphed because, say, you know, you play the Martyr, they know that you're going to be playing the Adam Warlock, they play a Lizard there, and then suddenly your whole thing sucks, and your downside is extremely pronounced. The Martyr will try to lose you the game. And it just seems like not exactly a card that makes a ton of sense in really any meta of Marvel Snap, but I like I, I could be missing something. I don't think that I am. I just think that it's it's just a little bit iffy to make this a one four. I think they're likely trying to mirror Captain Marvel as a four power unit. And that's why the previous iteration of this was a six power unit, because uh, longtime players will remember that Captain Marvel used to be a six power unit. But I think that that is a mistake, because as the game develops, it will be OK to change these cards in different ways. One of the major strengths Marvel Snap has is the ability to use OTAs and patches to make cards better or worse. So if there's a metagame where Captain Marvel needs to stay at her current cost, but Martyr can get buffed, I feel like trying to make her mirror Captain Marvel is actually a mistake. It's prioritizing flavor a little bit too heavily over whether the card can actually be played. And right now, I don't think that Captain Marvel or that Martyr is worth playing. In fact, I even think Captain Marvel could get a buff. And that's the interesting bit. Like, I think Captain Marvel could get a buff, but what, are you going to keep them all mirrored? If Captain Marvel gets a buff, do you have to buff Martyr? I just don't think that makes a ton of sense to me personally, and I don't think this card is a good reason to open spotlight caches. That said, there are other cards in her cache. Unfortunately, those cards are Jean Grey and Spider-Man 2099. Now, I don't want this to come off like I think those cards are like complete garbage or anything like that. But again, what we're looking at here is whether this is a good usage of your very rare spotlight keys, and that means that there needs to be a lot of reasons to open a box. Like, honestly, even if the card, that new card that comes out is amazing, there still needs to be, like, you know, some other value in the box for it to be really, really good to open for it because of the way the spotlight caches work. And Jean Grey, I think, is a good card. I honestly think Jean Grey is good. I do not think Jean Grey is great. Uh, she has a lot of utility. Like, honestly, you can play this card. It will do good things for you. It, I think Jean Grey suffered a bit from being released in a metagame that was extremely hostile to her, where a lot of the best decks were very able to deal with her restriction. Uh, and then since then, you know, the metagame has gotten I, a little bit better for her, but not overly better for her. And the main thing that Jean Grey does not want to see in a metagame is stuff that is totally okay, 
filling up a lane and then not actually having that lane filled up. So like the Elsa stuff was kind of nightmarish for Jean Grey because Elsa decks can just be like, yeah, well, I'm going to go to that lane then. It's going to be fine. I have Jeff's stuff. Uh, Jean Grey tends to be pretty good in like Guardians lockdown shells and Eliath type stuff. But I'm not sure if she's actually necessary for those shells to function. And when you're looking for a card out of a spotlight cache, you want to get the stuff that's necessary for your decks to work before you get the stuff that's like good flex tech. And Jean Grey, I think, is good flex tech rather than like an incredibly powerful and unique effect on her own. She requires like a very specific context within which to operate. But in that context, she can be quite useful. Spider-Man 2099, honestly, I think could use a buff. It's not necessarily his fault. It's more that, like, it's hard to find a good use for a card. And I think a lot of the cards, like, in this box that are like Spider-Man 2099, in the sense that these aren't cards that you can't ever build around, but they all run into the same issue, which is... What is this doing that's better than other options that you have, right? What are the situations that make Spider-Man 2099 worth playing over other comparable options? And I think that's the major thing people need to think about when it comes to, you know, how metagames tend to shape up is why would I do this? Like, you need a good reason to be doing this. So with Spider-Man 2099, your good reason is something like, you know, uh, there's a deck out there that is putting one really strong guy in every lane and Spider-Man 2099 can win me those games. And that if that were true, that would be a reason to run this card, but it's not. And it almost never has been. And he ends up in a situation where his utility is there, but it's never been useful. And I think that that is sort of the major issue that a lot of the cards in this cache tend to have, actually. Jean Grey is a lot like that, where it's like, okay, when am I going to make Jean Grey really good for me, as opposed to, like, the 11th or 12th card in my deck? And the context for that happening is not always there. And Martyr has the same issue, where it's like, okay, why would I play this when I could play Ant-Man? And it's, you know, maybe there's a reason that I'm missing. Maybe you're interested in a 1-4. Maybe you want to try Adam Warlock. But again, we're sort of reaching very far for something that, is not all that good in the context of the metagame. And I think that that is sort of the theme of this box. So for me, I will be avoiding spending any keys on this at all. I don't plan on trying to open this box. This is not a very good one. Between Martyr, Jean Grey, and Spider-Man 2099, like both the new card and the old cards in this box are uh, somewhere in the somewhere between bad and good but unexciting and i think that that means that they should likely be avoided especially in the context of the upcoming boxes december 5th brings us the blob who is a six cost three power unit but when he enters the battlefield you get to destroy your entire deck and add all the power in it to the blob so a lot of people look at this guy as a counter to dark hawk he does have one other ability though is an ongoing ability that says can't be moved. Now, one interaction that I'm a little bit curious on is what happens if you Enchantress the Blob? Because Enchantress reads, remove all abilities from the cards that have ongoing abilities. Does that remove his uh, accumulated power? I don't think it should, but it is kind of interesting if it does. That said, the major utility of this guy seems to be twofold. The first is... He can be like a really good card in Thanos to deal with what is a really bad matchup in the form of Darkhawk. You get one really big guy, you shrink a Darkhawk. However, I think that sort of misses why exactly Darkhawk is a bad matchup for Thanos. It's not just that Darkhawk is a big unit in the Thanos matchup. It's that Thanos is uniquely vulnerable to the damage of drawing a rock or skipping a draw. The issue that Thanos has is that it needs to roll downhill. It wants to be playing a bunch of stones and rolling downhill and doing a bunch of stuff and then playing its big guys. Now, this is part of the reason why Loki is so good against it. And though notably, the blob doesn't do anything to fix the major problem with Thanos, which is Loki. And I think that that is a much more salient issue to the Thanos archetype 
because the major thing that Thanos is trying to do is play like a bunch of cheap guys on the first three turns of the game, accelerate into a five cost card on four, a five cost card on five, and a five and a six cost card on six a lot of the time, right? Loki doing that to you for free means that they're a very bad matchup because Loki gets to play a normal game, then Loki you on four, then play exactly the stuff that you're playing on five and six, and they're better at it. By the same token, Killmonger stuff, also a bad matchup. Killmonger ends up killing off all the stuff you invested in early, and that means that your game plan effectively boils down to five drop on four, five drop on five, six drop on six, and that's probably not going to win anything. That is sort of the major issue that Thanos as an archetype faces. So I think people are going to look at the blob and say this is a problem solver for Thanos against the Darkhawk matchup, and it isn't actually going to do that. Uh, I don't know what it will do. Like, this is a very unpredictable ability. I tend to look at it and say, I don't think this is very good. That is my, like, base opinion of the blob. It's like, all right, I, I like, it seems a little too niche for me to be interested in it. Uh, weirdly, the can't be moved stuff does mean that he'll give you some free wins some of the time, I think. But, like, it's, it's, it's not like that, uh, common of a, of a thing you need to counterplay against. If we suddenly enter, like, Juggernaut Arrow meta. Or, you know, if they revert Arrow, I, I guess you'd still need priority in order for his ability to be face up. Who knows? But, like, I tend to look at this guy and say, all right, so I don't think he's very good. But what are the cases where he is? And I think the cases where he is are the cases where he is like just this obnoxiously large six cost guy. People will remember just how powerful the high evolutionary Hulk was when it was just like a consistent 618. If Blob ends up being like just consistently like just a six gigantic, right? Just enormous. And that would require for me like being like, you know, 16, 17, 18 range. I think that might actually be a pretty interesting card. Like, I don't know if that's ever a realistic thing that he can do, but if if this guy is consistently able to hit to 618, something along those lines, he's actually pretty good, and you can find uses for that. The issue is, you know, I don't think he will be able to do that consistently, but it is it is interesting that his information is basically hidden, because you, as the person playing the blob, know exactly how strong he's going to be, because you know what cards remain in your deck, your opponent does not know that, and so there's a little bit of hidden information with which you can make informed decisions and your opponent cannot. So there is, you know, there, there's legitimate threat to this guy that I think is kind of interesting, but ultimately it will depend on how big he actually can get on that final turn. I don't really see it as a Thanos counter to Darkhawk, although it is, you know, Thanos is going to have more cards in deck than most, so it might just be a big guy in Thanos. I'm interested in that, but... I don't necessarily know exactly how interested Thanos is in one big guy. We'll kind of have to see. And I don't think Thanos' problems are being solved by one big guy when those problems are Loki. So I don't expect Thanos blob to be kind of a thing, but I am interested to see what he can do. Stegron is a card that I think is similar to Jean Grey, where it's like, oh, there are decks that might actually be interested in this. Jean Grey is a little bit better. But the Stegron has the same issue where it's like, all right, what am I giving up to run this card? What is the card that I would otherwise be playing in this deck that I am now replacing with Stegron? And I think, you know, Jean Grey has a lot more actual use cases. It's a lot easier for me to say, I'd like to put Jean Grey in this deck than it is I'd like to put Stegron in this deck. But I do think, you know, Stegron's like a pretty good card. It's just one of those cards where it's hard to justify putting in a deck specifically because you are paying an opportunity cost of whatever other card you would be running. Now, Stegron by himself is not a reason to open any caches. I think that is very clear. However, the final card in the cache with Blob and Stegron is Jeff the Baby Landshark, which is widely acknowledged as the best two-cost card in the entire game. Jeff is, yeah, the best two-cost card in the entire game. So strong, in fact, that I kind of wonder if he's not just very hard to design around in the sense that other two-cost cards seem... It's just hard to make one that even in its own archetype is going to be that much better than Jeff. It's a very interesting design uh, question. I think we have gotten a little bit away from the Jeff meta, but that's mostly because Loki decks have stopped running the Jeff package, right? Like, the... 
Jeff meta was at its height with Elsa. Now that Loki decks and, uh, you know, bounce decks, all that stuff, they build around Werewolf. Jeff is a little bit less useful in those shells specifically. That said, I do think that it is just a card that you will never actually regret picking up. Jeff is probably the highlight of this box. Extremely, extremely powerful. And if you are going to open on this week, it I would suggest that Jeff is like 60% plus of the reason that you open for this box. On December 12th, Firestar enters the game. And Firestar is, I think, quite an interesting unit. Because of all the new cards coming out uh, in the caches, I think Firestar is the one that has the most obvious potential, which is you just play a bunch of cards on turn five. Mysterio seems like it would help with this, and then just buff them all up on turn six with her ability. Now, we talked about how 618 is kind of what we're looking at to like make a card really, really, really good as a six drop. And this card can easily get to those ranges when a Mysterio is involved. What I worry about is that it won't be exactly consistent enough in terms of putting out cards onto the board on that turn five that don't involve Mysterio, but the sort of, you know, Mysterio, some other cards into Firestar combo is quite powerful. That is that is some real stuff that you can be doing there, right? Like, it is very, very interesting. One interaction that I'd like to know about, though, is what about stuff like Brood and Mr. Sinister? Because my instinct is when I read Firestar that that shouldn't work. It'll only cop, it'll only buff the cards that were played the previous turn. I don't know if that's good enough, but if, if it does end up buffing those Broodlings, those Mr. Sinister clones, then it suddenly becomes a very real go wide threat. Like that is really, 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 really compelling. Another sort of fringe use for this card I think people will come up with is like, all right, what if we play this in Thanos? We play a bunch of stuff on five, accelerate into uh, this card on five. Like we play a bunch of stuff on four, including the time stone, accelerate into this card on five, play a bunch of stones. That's kind of interesting to me. Like that's that's fairly compelling. Is that like a hand buff Thanos with like a Koye and Nakia? Because I think the most interesting thing about Firestar is that she scales with herself she buffs her own power over to everything else, right? So it's not just three. It's, you know, if you Nakia her or Okoye her, it's four to everything. If you do both to her, it's five to everything. If you forge her, it's five to everything. And I think that's where she starts getting actually very, very, very powerful, which is in some sort of hand buff board spam deck. So there's like a Okay, can we do Thanos where we time stone into her? Can we do... I mean, Thanos is a deck that's already kind of interested in having a full hand, so Nakia makes sense there. Okoye makes sense there. I, it's it's not the dumbest idea I've ever heard. I think the major downside of the Thanos stuff is if we do Thanos stuff, we end up giving up stuff like, you know, Professor X. We give up some of the ways to protect our one-cost cards from cards like Killmonger. And I think that, that sort of dance is going to be what keeps this card in check if anything does which is the best things to play with it end up being a bunch of one cost stuff. But if you're only playing one cost stuff, it gets like, oh man, I really didn't want to do that. But I mean, like, imagine playing Mysterio Forge into Firestar. That's unbelievably strong. That's 25 power if you count her own five, right? Like that's a, that's a big, big, big deal. And if you can just do that enough of the time, you're going to win a lot of games. This is a card that is quite powerful and definitely worth experimenting with. I won't be able to tell you whether or not it's meta relevant until we actually play with it. But of the cards in the caches, this is the one that I think is the most unique and the most exciting in terms of new cards coming out that I think could actually legitimately impact the meta game. I do think unfortunately though that it has one major issue and that major issue is Loki. Loki is a deck that will copy everything that you're doing and then do it a little bit better. And if you have a bunch of cards that are discounted that you are looking to play on turn five, like whatever your game plan is, it's going to be pretty linear. They low-key you on four, they get your Firestar, they get the rest of your deck. The rest of your deck is built to facilitate Firestar. They're going to play more cards than you can on turn five. And then they're going to play a Firestar that's probably bigger than the one you have. That's an issue. Now, one way to sort of make it a little bit asymmetrical is a card like a Koye or Nakia, which so your copy of Firestar is bigger than their copy of Firestar, but it is definitely something that you're gonna have to be a little bit afraid of. And I think that is tough. It's a tough thing to deal with. I do, I am excited for this card, but I am also worried about the impact Loki may have on her.
First up in the caches with Firestar, we have Ravona Renslayer, who has become something of a quasi staple in like some Mr. Negative builds, and uh, like an even more quasi staple in like these weird Dark Hawk Goblin type decks. Neither of them are decks I recommend you picking her up for, but she's a fine throw in in terms of if you were already invested in Firestar. It's fine to get this card. I don't think she's particularly good. I would have her roughly similar to, say, like the Jean Grey type tier. Maybe a little bit above Stegron in that sort of group of cards. And she's good. Like, she does some things. She has a role. And it's good that she has a role now because she really didn't at 3-3. But she's definitely not, like, an exciting reason to open caches. Still, if you are looking to pick this card up, now would be a pretty good time. I actually think the Living Tribunal is a pretty exciting reason to open caches, and I, I know that sounds weird, it's like I dump on the deck a lot, but it's a deck, like it's a real deck unto itself, and I have a lot of priority when I come to recommending things like this, I place a lot of priority on, can you open this card and immediately play it in something that's going to make your account better, and I think, you know, for a lot of players, you know, a Living Tribunal deck is not going to make your your deck, your account better. It's not going to like increase the value of your account in the sense that like you're not going to be like doing a much higher win rate, but it is a real option that you now have access to. If you ever wanted to do that, like now you can. And I think Living Tribunal is actually pretty exciting as an inclusion here. I do think that Living Tribunal is never going to be a top meta deck. Like it can be a deck that's around, but it's never going to be the deck with a target on its back because it is so easy to deal with once the target is on its back if it ever takes up a significant portion of meta share, it ends up being a lot easier to beat than several other decks that could be taking up that portion of top meta share, which is sort of why we almost never see a deck built like Living Tribunal be like the top deck. Rather, it's like a deck that you can play, but is mostly there to catch people off guard. And that is a good role to have uh, when you want to catch people off guard. Like that is a good thing to do. And I think that's a good way to have cards like this in your game. From a design standpoint, I like what Living Tribunal is doing. It's easily countered, but if you don't have the counters, it's very powerful. It's like what people thought Galactus would be, <laughs> where it's like Galactus was a lot more frustrating. Living Tribunal is like, okay, the deck is so obviously bad that you just sort of, when they pull it off against you, you're like, all right, well, well done, right? Because the most efficient and effective ways of playing this card are either waving out an Onslaught Iron Man, using Invisible Woman Hella Modoc, things like that, that are just like very clearly not good plans if they get disrupted in any real way. And that is, I think, a, a, it's sort of like a fixed Galactus, honestly. Like if you were a Galactus player, Living Tribunal might actually fill that hole in your heart. Finally, on December 19th, Havoc enters the collector's cache, and effectively what he says is, okay, when you play this guy, you are no longer gaining energy. You lose an energy crystal at the end of every turn, and, you know, naturally in Marvel Snap, you gain one at the beginning of every turn. So you sort of cap yourself at whatever energy you were at when you played him. And honestly, when I look at this guy, I think, wow, that really sucks. I really hate this card. I don't know exactly what you're supposed to do with it right now. I look at it and I'm like, I think this is one of the worst cards I've ever seen them make. I don't know why I would want to be spending tokens on this. I get it. I can Viper him. But like, jeez, that does not seem worth doing because you're taking the hit at least one turn when you're trying to Viper him. Maybe you can do it on four. You go like this guy plus Viper on four. You give it to your opponent. But even then, it's sort of like Vipering an Ebony Maw, where it's like, okay, you know, that's really good, but it also doesn't ever seem to be good enough to be relevant because some of the time you draw the Viper without him and some of the time you draw him without the Viper, and you're just like, oh, man, this is not really doing it for me. It's not it's not helping at all. I, I don't get this guy. I really don't. I really wish I did, but I simply do not understand it. Sometimes when I look at these cards and these boxes, I think, okay, they know this card is bad, right? And that's why they put these cards in with it. Because the cards that are in the box with Havoc are two of the best toolbox cards in Marvel Snap. Nico Minoru is the first one. She is a key piece of the Wolf Bounce Shell, which is one of the strongest things to be doing in Marvel Snap right now. Across like four different decks, the Wolf Bounce Shell is dominant. Nico is a major part of that. Because she is so powerful, getting to use her multiple times is also extremely powerful. 
it allows you to play her out early for marginal value and then pull her back into your hand with Falcon or Beast and make sure you're getting something extremely strong off of her, like, you know, a demon or a buff on your fire star, even maybe, who knows, uh, or a clone or any of those kind of powerful things that are the real reason you put her in the deck. And I think that, that the fact that all of her abilities are on reveal, she gives you extra location control, she lets you move stuff around even when you don't necessarily need to, that helps with Werewolf 2. Like, she's just great. She's an unbelievable utility card right now, one of the best toolbox cards in the entire game of Marvel Snap, and one of her only real rivals is the other card in this box. That's right, it's Legion. Now, Legion is a card I like to think of as a bellwether for mid-range archetypes in the entire game, because... This guy is exactly elite when 5-7 is not an embarrassing stat line. So there are certain metagames, and I think currently we're kind of in one, where 5-7 is an embarrassing stat line. And whenever it's not an embarrassing stat line, you want to be playing this guy as much as you can. But whenever it is an embarrassing stat line, he's kind of not measuring up to the things that make 5-7 an embarrassing stat line. So in the current context, that would be things like Werewolf, that would be things like Collector Loki. Those are the things that are making 5-7 a little bit of an embarrassing stat line to include in your deck. That said, it we're closer to him being not embarrassing than we were in the height of the Elsa meta, where you would play a Legion and your opponent would play a Vision with an Elsa buff, and it would just be like, okay, that's awful. I lose every time whenever they do that because they have the... 5'10", 5'11", movable guy, and I have a 5'7". So that does suck. But I do think that we're getting closer and closer to metas where Legion actually makes sense. But I do think Legion can only ever be played, and I know this sounds weird, but most of the time he's icing, which is to say you already have a very strong shell to go with him, and then he goes on top of that shell. He's the icing on a Darkhawk shell, right? He was the icing on our original builds of Loki before Elsa came out. He wasn't necessarily a core card. He's just a great piece of toolbox usable where you just get a lot of value out of having him. You get a lot of value out of reducing the RNG that affects you in a game like this. It's a very powerful card, but I do think that it is more icing than cake here. Like, this is a card that you probably will play a lot of, but I don't know. I think he mostly goes in decks that are already dominant and makes them better, as opposed to being something that makes the deck good in the first place. He is mostly a card that makes good decks better rather than being a card that makes bad decks good. And that's not like a knock on him. It's just an accurate description of how I think about this card. All right, y'all, it's going to stop there for today, but don't worry, we'll be back covering the next cards that come out after this video. We'll be taking a look at the cards coming out end of December into January, uh, much closer to the time they actually come out. Let me know what you think about this video. I tend to only do these pretty sparingly because I don't really want to overdo the concept, but I had a lot of fun looking at these cards, and overall, I think there are a couple cards that really stick out to me in terms of which are going to be worth opening. I think the best cards in these boxes are going to be Nico Minoru, going to be Legion, going to be maybe Firestar, and going to be Jeff. Those are going to be the main cards that you're going to be looking to open if you want to target them. Take a look at what you have in your collection before you make a decision about this, though, because it is very important to understand that in Marvel Snap, what matters is what you can build. Remember, build toward decks, not just cards. The cards I talk about are good because they go in a lot of decks, or in the case of Firestar, are very, very exciting and could be potential new archetypes. That said, cards like Legion are going to go in a ton of decks. Cards like Nico Minoru are going to go in a ton of decks. Cards like Jeff are going to go in a ton of decks. They're very safe to pick up for that reason, and that's why I highlighted them. Still, you should be like thinking pretty hard about, can I build a good deck with this card right now when you look to open these cards? As always, I've been Cam Best. You've been amazing. I'm pretty sure I just hit my mic and I'm leaving it in. I will see you in the next one.